a very, very good morning, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, back uh, at a building which actually in the, is in the ward uh, that I represent and owned by the City of London Corporation, uh, this beautiful building. So uh, welcome to the first panel of the day. Um, as Claire says, I'm Keith Bottom, I'm the Deputy Leader of the City of London Corporation, and I'm joined by a very distinguished and talented panel uh, this morning. So we've got Susan Allen, who is Chief Executive of Yorkshire Building Society, Sharon Doherty, who is Chief People and Places Officer at Lloyds Banking Group. Amelia Sykes, who is Director of Strategy and Business Management at M&G PLC. And not least, or not last but not least, James Rowe, who is Partner at Allen and Overy. So uh, this session uh, is uh, entitled, as you'll have seen from the, uh, from the agenda, uh, Investing in Skills to Unlock Productivity, uh, the New Boardroom Priority where we plan to discuss the imperative uh, to invest in skills, of course, in the FS sector. Uh, we're going to discuss the why, the what and the how of ensuring that the sector has access to these skills critical to uh, its future success, the challenges facing the industry. And we've touched on it. Emily and Bruce have both touched on uh, the reports that have been produced, at least of all the Financial Services Skills Commission's report launched in November last year, which I hope you've all seen, read and valued. Uh, greater investment in skills at the centre of that. Um, the City of London Corporation has been a long-standing um, collaborative and close working partner of both the uh, Commission. I was on the board as a director of the Commission uh, for some time uh, and with TCUK on this vital skills agenda around uh, socio-economic diversity as well, actually, where we formed a task force promoting the progression of diverse talent, uh, which is very much part of this agenda. Um, you might have seen our report that the benchmarking report that we produce every year, the corporation, um, that uh, put London back at the top in terms of global uh, rankings, uh, partly due to the high scores on, on skills and talent. Uh, but that has got to be maintained. And as Emily was saying, it'd be interesting to get the panel's reaction on the new trends in technology, on AI, on automation. Uh, as job roles change and, and that requires significant digital upskilling to maintain that really important competitiveness that we have uh, in the uh, sector and in the city uh, of particularly. So um, Emily uh, posed uh, the question at the end of her uh, remarks, uh, what are firms doing and uh, is it enough? So we're going to find out. Uh, let me turn to you first, Susan, the Yorkshire Building Society. Can you give us your take on what we've been hearing this morning and what your uh, approach to and, and real understanding is of the skills challenges for the sector and for, for your organisation? Brilliant. Well, well, first of all, good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here today and it's a pleasure for us to be, to be supporting this event. Um, I suspect that in this room it's sort of like speaking to the converted because everybody's here because they believe in the value of, of skills. But if I think about our own organisation, we've been here for 160 years and we've continued to evolve and change to make sure that we're continuing to meet the needs of our, our, our customers and our members. And I think making sure that we have the right skills to deliver the very best experience to our customers is something that's absolutely critical to us. We won't survive if we're not delivering and delivering in a really productive and effective way. And I think you can extrapolate that across the sector. You know, having the right skills means we can deliver and we can continue to compete. Um, you know, that's easy to say, but then the, the, the question is, what do you do about it? And for us, one of the things that's been really helpful recently has been the work of the Financial Services Skills Commission, and in particular, the Future Skills Framework. Because if you think about skills, you think about what skills you need to develop, you, you sort of need a way of structuring that so that you can make some really conscious choices. And mm -hmm. for us, the framework has been, has been really, really helpful. We also wanted to think not just about what we need for Yorkshire Building Society, but how can we support the sector and make sure that we're part of a thriving FS sector across the UK. And, and hence, our chair was a real driving force in working with the Financial Services Skills Commission, the City UK, the corporation, to set up the Yorkshire and Humber Profe Financial and Professional Services Skills Commission. It's a bit of a mouthful. Dan is smiling over there because I, I inevitably get it wrong. But the, the key thing is, whatever the long name, the intent of the work has been has been really well set and I think as, as that collaboration has brought really tangible benefits that we might come to, on to touch on. Yeah, um, I should have said at the beginning, uh, there's time for questions, so please do um, either write them down, make a note, um, there's supposed to be an app somewhere, I don't know if that's actually up and running. Uh, oh, Miles has got the app, so uh, uh, no questions from Miles allowed though. 
Um, but uh, but we'll come to the floor for questions um, uh, later on when uh, when we've heard from each of our panel. Um, we were going to have an interactive discussion, so if there's any points that you want to come in on, uh, please please just uh, jump in. We don't want to be too uh, formulaic about it. Let me come to you, Sharon. There, Lloyd's Banking Group, very big organisation, lots of people, um, and and it's and it's uh, how are you going about developing that uh, that bank into the group into a skills based organisation, and what are the critical components uh, to achieving that for you? Uh, great uh, pleasure to be here, and I'm going to do a big pun first up for, I can't pronounce it either, but the FSSC, um, and um, we're fortunate enough to be part of um, uh, the, the board there, um, and the work that Claire and Mark are doing is extraordinary. I think it's a massive boost for UK PLC productivity, and I think uh, if you're not a member, uh, you know, sign up. Uh, if you're a regulator, uh, if um, uh, you know you're uh, you know in the ecosystem, get behind it because I think it's a real uh, uh, opportunity for us to, as I say, grow UK PLC. Um, I'm a chief people and place officer at Lloyd's Banking Group. I don't come from financial services, actually. I sort of say that, um, and we'll talk about that perhaps uh, uh, later on. Um, and uh, so I sort of I, I come into um, the role that I'm in with a different perspective, and I've been in and around technology um, in pure play fintechs, uh, telco, uh, consulting, and other organizations. And I spent a lot of my career um, in Silicon Valley. And so you sort of get to see um, how uh, skills have uh, developed uh, over the last decade or two. And if I'm really honest, although there are lots of stats about the UK is in a pretty solid place, um, I think we're just not where we need to be. And we've got a lot of the good building blocks, <clears throat> but we're not investing enough and we need to go faster on, on this agenda. It's a massive uh, enabler of, 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 of growth. Um, I think when I look at skills-based organisation, um, uh, I think uh, organisations generally get some of what that means and then miss the hard bits. Yeah. So the bits that I think we all um, run towards are... Um, uh, you know, we, uh, we need to train people on certain things and we need to hire people with, uh, with certain skills. And I think most of us sort of get that, um, that part of skills-based organisation. But the bits that we miss that really um, uh, connect it to uh, the business strategy and then uh, make it feel really important for people, the first part is the link into strategic workforce planning and the building blocks of capabilities that organizations need. So before you get to the micro skills, what are the macro capabilities that you believe your organization needs to be able to win in the market today, but probably much more importantly, Horizon 2 and Horizon 3. Yeah, and I think most organizations get really lost in that and, and they get caught in the sort of specific skills that we need to focus on, which are important, but, but um, uh, uh, are not enough. Those need to go into your operating model and they need to go into your role profiles so that skill, that, that macro capability that translate into skills are hardwired into how you do business and your financial processes. So that bit, I think, um, we're just not good enough uh, uh, at most organisations. I would include my own. We're on a, we're on a sort of fast catch-up um, journey. Uh, if you then go to the sort of back end of um, uh, people um, uh, sort of life cycle, the, the link of skills into performance management and reward, again, is another part where I think we're all struggling with how you really do that. But if you don't join it up to ultimately what goes into people's pockets, then it's sort of interesting, but it, it doesn't feel like it's absolutely business critical. So I think, uh, you know, the middle bit, I think we're pretty good at. The, the, the front end and the back end of skills-based organisation, I think um, we've got a lot to do. Uh, and in terms of, you know, what, what are the things that uh, are really critical um, to sort of supercharge that full end-to-end? Um, I do think the taxonomy uh, that the FSSC have put together is a, a, a real um, sort of step in the right direction. Uh, I think, though, we need to move from uh, sort of the skills we need now to Horizon 2, Horizon 3 skills, because we, we can't get ready for the future unless we're sort of thinking further, further ahead. Uh, I think um, uh, we are all grappling with how do we create growth mindset um, cultures for learning organisations. I think we find that 
really hard because we get caught up in doing the job rather than getting um, skilled, um, skilled for the future. And probably the last bit to, um, to sort of say, uh, I, I sort of don't think in boardrooms and in um, the next level down, the, the executive committee, skills are being talked about enough. Um, so, so they're not seen as hardcore uh, and part of driving growth in your business sufficiently. Um, and, and I think until we do those things, sort of skills-based organisation are sort of going to be something that you do in HR functions. And honestly, if I was a business leader, I would not be leaving this to my HR function. I say that and I think I'd run a pretty good one, but it's too important to the future of your company. So. Um, uh, you know, those are the sorts of things yeah. that are in there. Well, thank you. We'll come back. I'll come back on because you, you've got a telecoms background, haven't you? So we'll talk about what we think the sector, or you think the sector, can learn from um, yeah. other sectors. Um, yeah. But I want to bring everybody in for a comment first, and then we'll come back round. Amelia, so over to you at M and G uh, now. What do you think are the essential skills needed for successful future leaders? So we can talk about leadership now in that space. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me here today. It's, it's fantastic to engage on this topic. And I think as you're alluding to, Sharon, we have more and more to do here. Um, I think you've heard all of our opening speakers allude to the level of change that we see around us. Um, and I think it's worth throwing that out because actually the scale of that change, the pace and acceleration of that change is greater than it's ever been. When you look at what's happening from a climate perspective, technology, demographic change, and sort of made all the more complex by a, a dose of sort of demogra uh, geopolitical risk within that as well. So I think you might argue that the sort of skill sets of leaders aren't materially different from what we've sort of always asked from great leaders. But I think in that context, there are certain elements of that skill set that are more fundamental and more critical than they've ever been. Um, so I guess you start with the, the what, that kind of strategic vision. Um, and having that ability to look through that landscape and see the opportunities, not just the, the risks and the challenges. And I suppose when you think about that, within these things that we see, whether that's a technological AI, mention it again, um, that doesn't require our leaders necessarily to be experts in all of these things. But what it does require, I think, is a level of curiosity um, and an appetite to understand them enough to see the art of the possible and to see those opportunities. I think you then get into the execution of that. So what are those priorities? How do you translate that into a really clear action plan? And how do you start to understand that change capacity of your organization? And I think, as you were mentioning, Sharon, that capability and capacity for change, which we have to have a much more analytical approach to that and ability to understand that. And equally, you know, it's, it's been alluded to a little already, um, and it obviously comes across in some of the FSSC's skills um, empathy as a skill set within that, um, the understanding of what some people in your organisation are going to feel that this is really uncomfortable. How do you make this feel like something that everyone can get on board with and, and can work their way through? Um, and obviously that does come down to that skills planning and perhaps having a slightly more sort of creative or even radical approach to talent and thinking about how you prepare for some of these skills which some of them don't exist today. Um, or they're at the very early stages, so you can't just buy that talent anymore. You have to be able to build some of it as well. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, right, we come to the law now. Lawyers, a uh, very important part of the, uh, of, of, the, of the city's competitiveness. And uh, James, so at Allen and Overy, what do you see as the uh, role of private practice lawyers and how that will change over the next five to ten years? Um, and given those changes, what skills will the next generation of lawyers need? I, I think lawyers are an interesting <coughs> case study because skills, well, we're interesting anyway, we're slightly odd, uh, but um, <laughs> skills are essential to what we do and our lifespan is quite short if we're not skilled up. Uh, I expect my job in the way that I currently do it will not exist in three to five years. Now, you could take that and say, oh my God, or you could be quite excited about it. I've convinced myself I need to be in the latter. Um, <laughs> And if we look at what's happening to what we do, and, and, and everything's mixed up here, it's skills, it's value, it's, it's what your place is in the work. And a lot of what lawyers do, we've historically said, well, look, it's, it's very complex, therefore we should be paid for it. And, and it's high value. And, and what we're finding, and we're challenged by this, is increasingly this work will become flow work. With technology, 
and with the increasing sophistication of our clients, we won't get paid for what we've done previously. And if you talk to every lawyer, they will say, well, what I do is bespoke. It's not going to get automated. And I like teasing my private equity colleagues by saying private equity is going to become flow work. They disagree with me strongly, and they say capital markets is going to become flow work. And, and what you do, and there's a lovely quote in the report, just to prove I read it, uh, from someone at Phoenix, which says, it's a shift from product to service. And I think you can draw the same distinction between flow and bespoke work. Um, and, and if we look at technology in this, and to, to give this a bit of color, uh, we have a vast finance practice. Okay? We, we have been top tier for the last 10, 15 years. So we sit on a massive bank of precedents. If we stack all of that and we digitalize it, and then we go in and we mine it for insights and precedents, we create a moat around our business, which if other firms don't have that bank of information, we have an advantage in that sector. Now, that has a number of consequences. First of all, you're institutionalizing know-how. Okay? Lawyers are experts in the law and they're experts in how to do things. Suddenly, you're taking that expertise in how to do something and you're making an institutional asset. So you're changing the relationship between the lawyer and the firm and therefore the lawyer's sense of self and their sense of value. And insecure lawyers tend to carry imposter syndromes, at least I'm talking about myself. So, so you've, got, you've then got to deal with that. And, and if you're a partner managing a team, you've got to be acutely aware how the digitalization of what we do and the automation of it is, is impacting people's expectations. Um, I could talk for a long time. I'm just going to say a couple more points. First of all, and imagine you're at your desk, got a couple of screens. As a lawyer, I'd sit there, I'd have links to external data, uh, databases with, with documents. I'd have my internal precedents. I'd have links to commercial information. Document comes into me. I can run, we're doing this now. I can run, if I've got the right data stack, I can get a document, look at it and say, I don't like this clause, can you show me some precedents? It goes through my data stack, it comes up with precedents. I say, you know what, I want to build this into this clause. I use a bit of generative AI, it drafts it for me. This isn't the future, this technology is available now. So I am now becoming very much the craftsperson, okay, like the tailor. I get to choose the tools that I use and they're all there, and, but I need people to sharpen those tools to keep them fresh. So some of today's lawyers will become the people that look after the tools. People like me will argue against retirement. We'd want to go in and we'd say, look, let's look after the tools now and make sure they're sharp for the people who are going to be using them. But, but then the way I explain how I use that tool to the clients then becomes the key competitive advantage. And we're going back into empathy. We're going back into the ability to relate to people, to see the world from their perspective. Okay, and as an example of that and kind of how one has to look at things and constantly flip things around, I'm just going to take the heading on the piece of paper today, which says, what will inspire you today? I think the right question is, how will you inspire others today? And I think the lawyers that we're training in our organization, we're training to think that way the whole time, to look at things, to flip them on their head, and to, to, to have the tools available to them that empower them to do that. Very good. I'm glad you're in the second category that you described and not the first. That's uh, <laughs> very good to know. Um, right, Susan, can I come back to you. Um, let's talk about uh, the uh, difference in the contrast between experienced hires and early careers talent. How do you see that um, need to attract both uh, from a sector perspective, but also what you're doing at Yorkshire Building Society? Well, first of all, obviously, we do need to attract both. It's brilliant to bring in people, particularly people actually from outside our sector who bring really diverse and different ways of thinking about things. So that's, that's definitely something we look for in our experienced hires. Um, I think whether you're looking for experienced uh, hires or new starts, one of the things that's really clear is that people want to belong in an, an organisation, a sector that has some sort of meaning and purpose. Uh, they also want to join organisations where they can see progression. I think in the survey recently, 30% of under 30s are saying one of the main reasons they'll join an organisation is because they can see progression. And I think that's true whether you're at the beginning of your career or later on in your career. So this commitment to skills that we've been talking about is really important for people, whatever stage they're at. And for me, one of the things we're thinking about is... Um, as Sharon described, how, what skills will we need, not for today, uh, because if we don't have them today, we'll probably have to buy them, but that's not the sustainable answer. But what skills do we need for five, ten years' time, even if it's 
as you described, the macro rather than the micro, so that we can start to create some of those skills. And we've actually used the Financial Services Skills Commission, the, this Future Skills Framework, as a way to assess, and actually our Chief People Officer is here today, so I'm sure all will be happy to, to share more with others. But we've gone through 70% of the roles in our organisation, and we've assessed them against that framework and identified where we see the key gaps are. And, and, and they're in some of the really obvious areas like data and digital, but they're also critically in areas like empathy. Because as we see the world that James describes, it's that combination of having the great digital, the great tools to deliver for our customers, but it's also the people who will bring that to life. And, and so very important that we don't get sort of all caught up in data and digital and forget that we still need people and that those skills will actually be what makes a difference. So for us, I think attracting people in at whatever life stage they're at, it's absolutely critical that we can demonstrate uh, that we are interested in their development and that we're committed to that. And one of the practical ways we're doing this is by um, repurposing our apprentice levy funding, making sure that we're investing in developing some of those skills for our existing colleagues. Because I, I want uh, to lead a business where we are creating those opportunities for people who work for us today to still be working for us in five, six, seven years, if that is their choice, but to have given them the skills to be successful in that new world. So, so very important, I think, wherever you are on the spectrum. Great, thanks, Susan. Um, Sharon. Can I pick up on something? Yes, please, please. You've asked yes, us to be interactive. Yes, please. Um, uh, just on, the, on the, 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 the need to look after people's careers, I think we have, one of our main risks is retention risk. You tool people up and then they leave and someone else benefits from that. And, and you've got to develop a, a new social workplace contract with them, which I think is, is based on your looking out for their longer term needs and objectives. And if they feel, because there's insecurity about what the future world would look like, what would technology do to my job, what will my role look like? And I think if, you're in, if the people that work for you have confidence that you, you have a good idea as to what it might look like, mm. and you're going to give them a fair crack at it and look after them, it, that starts to make people stickier and, and it, it provides that, that very environment that, that you're talking about. But if I can add one more small thing, building on you a little bit, I think the, another key point there, though, is something that Bruce touched on in his introduction, which is the collaboration across the broader yeah. sector. And some of the work we were doing in, in Yorkshire and Humber is really about working with, you know, not just financial services firms, but professional services, and saying, actually, some of that skills development can happen. So somebody might work in our organisation, might go and work in, in Sharon's organisation or in a professional services firm and then come back in with new skills so it's also about how we create that community and you know in particular I think outside London demonstrating to people that there are diverse careers and career paths that can help you to get those skills so I think collaboration is also key yeah great thanks very much for being interactive wonderful <laughs> um, Sharon you, you you've got a telecoms background you're now in a, a, a big bank um, what can the financial services sector learn from other sectors, do you believe? And something that Susan said just piqued my interest on apprenticeship levy. What do you want, and, and I might ask this of all the panel, the government, whichever government we have, uh, skills is going to be a critical agenda. What do you want to see happening in that, in that space if the apprenticeship levy has not worked as well as anybody wanted it to? So what is your view on that as well, please? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, what can we learn? I, I would say more broadly rather than just telecoms, because I wouldn't say telecoms is um, the, the best industry. Um, but I think uh, a few things. So, um, so firstly, uh, I, think, um, I, I think financial services is too insular. Um, uh, and I think our mindset isn't, it isn't open enough. And, and that's stopping uh, the, um, uh, the industry being permeable in a way that you see other industries being. And I think the FSSC um, report last year said in, a, um, I, I, you know, in an industry with a million people, only 11,000 new people join a year. And um, having worked in loads of other industries, that just sort of feels like way, way too few mm -hmm. people coming in with different perspectives that can uh, sort of, uh, you know, really... Um, uh, really challenge how um, how the industry thinks and and not incrementally change but um, make step changes which I think every industry needs to be doing and new people with different ideas I think um, I think can um, can really help that um, I think what you see in in other industries and I think the tech industry is probably the best at thinking through skills and I remember being in Silicon Valley in probably 2014-15 and sitting, listening to Google, talking about having not enough data scientists, uh, and I was in Vodafone at the time, they had 5,000. 
and we were sitting going, what's a data scientist? Yeah, and we sort of came back and said, gosh, we've got to get going on, on, uh, on this. Um, and at, at that point, they were also starting to think about quantum computing. Yeah, and, and I think, it, you know, I think if you go to um, their organisations now, uh, you know, we're still all thinking, what is quantum computing and what might it mean? And I think if you're in some of those organisations, you're already starting to think about the use cases um, for, uh, um, for some of that technology. Um, and what you see on the back of that mindset is the tech firms uh, will be investing, uh, I don't know, sort of one one and a half thousand pounds per person on skills and training and I think if we were all to sort of look at ourselves I don't think we'd be saying um, you know that that's um, that that's where we are so if you really believe in things senior people are focusing on them thinking about them in the future and investing in them so so I think um, you sort of get that part of it and then I think other industries are, uh, are just sort of much more playful around skills we're starting to get into it but the gamification certification hacks um, deal days, uh, you know, sort of just doing things that inspire people um, to uh, to engage in learning in a um, in a different way. Um, so, you know, the good news is there's a ton of fantastic stuff to learn uh, out there, and I think uh, you know we as an industry have got to go probably um, uh, learn more from the outside in, but also think about other people in other industries that could come in and help us. Um, you know, sort of uh, jump over some of the stages of learning that we might go through. Um, on the uh, on the levy, I mean, actually, Lloyd's. Uh, you know, we feel pretty good about the levy. So, if we look over the last decade, we have had um, over ten thousand apprentices. So, I think probably one of the largest apprentice um, organisations in the in the in in the UK. Um, I think if. Um, uh, uh, if, if we could, I think broadening how the levy uh, gets used, I think could could be um, helpful. Yeah, so um, okay. so that it can be invested in a in a broader way. Great. I'm going to come to the audience for questions. We've got 15 minutes left, and uh, and then we'll see how many we've got. We can come back again. Gentleman at the back with a hand up. Thank you. Um, less of a question, more an observation. I think that brings together many of the strands, but. As someone who joined on a graduate program 12 years ago and in my first sort of leadership role, I think it's really challenging to balance that investing in skills and unlocking productivity because you're, you're in large organizations where the focus might be on sort of profit in the short term or NOI, how you're investing two or three years in someone and actually thinking of them as the organizational talent rather than your team is something that really needs to come from the top of an organization. Because if you're in middle management, your incentivization is NOI for that year or your team. So it, it's kind of pulling together a lot of what you've said today. And I don't know if you have any observations on that as leaders. Who'd like to take that one? I mean, I've, I've, th this problem is acute in, in law firms. We're driven by transactions. We're driven by the billable hour. and we're we get part of our internal validation through that. If you look at our smart timers that we fill in religiously, you don't have one for, the one for learning doesn't go to your annual target. If you do pro bono, and think it does, but not the learning one. And, and that we don't invest capital, so our investment is people and people's time. Uh, and I think we're struggling with it. We don't currently put enough emphasis on it. I think that will change, but we're, we're at the kind of the beginning of that journey. I think you do have people in the organization who that just because of who they are they're sufficiently brave that they just say you know what I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do and it's interesting and and if you can allow people like that who are inherently I find around the organization to put their head above the bunker and do that then you can you can start to generate that but also I think the, the line managers and I, I think partners are line managers um, it's our job to make sure that the people working for us have the confidence to invest time. So we've got to permanently make sure that they feel they can do that without being criticised for it. Oh, just a, a few. Um, uh, so it's interesting. It, uh, IBM, I don't know if they still do it, but th they, I think, um, uh, you know, really did some quite clever stuff in their organisation on, on pivoting uh, the, their skills. Um, and it was interesting, I think either on Workday or LinkedIn or something, you actually wore a badge that said how many hours of, of skills training you were, you were clocking up. 
um, and, and actually it was a badge of honor rather than um, you know something negative and, and actually you, you know, they almost had a league table for who was learning and of course it's future skills yeah not just any any, any old skill that they were really trying to um, encourage their organization to um, or they pick the people in their organization to focus on um, I think uh, the, um, the, the second part is um, functions like people functions can sort of help put the business case together uh, because the cost of uh, moving people on because they haven't got the right skills or hiring external people versus taking uh, good quality people with the right mindset and helping them reskill, then the numbers really do add up. And I think um, it's incumbent upon you know people functions to um, to do that. I think the third thing I would say is um, we're competing in a global world, and um, uh, you know being really tough. The world that we're competing in, um, people um, work in the day in their in their day job, and actually put probably you know maybe even too much of their personal time into reskilling. Um, I've just come back from the Lloyd's Technology Center in in India, and I'd sort of forgotten how hungry people are to learn. Um, and whilst you know I sit here in the UK and work life balance, you know we we've, we've we're you know, talking about all of those things that I think we really passionately believe in. You know, the, the truth is, though, we're competing on a global platform with people with different mindsets to learning. And, and somehow, probably, um, you know, both have got to come a bit closer, yeah, where um, we as individuals have to, to, you know, fight for our learning, do some of it in our own personal time, because if not, within a few years, we will not have the skills to do what we need to be doing. So I think as individuals, we need to do that. And at the same time, organizations, you know, we really need to get our act together on this agenda and, and start seeing it, you know, for what it is, a business imperative. I like the idea of the future skills badge. That's, yeah, that's, nice. That yeah. sounds good. Amelia, yeah, you want to No, I was just going to add actually on that point around imperative. I think actually within parts of the business, even if that's not set top down, that imperative materialises. So I sponsor a big piece of work around client data and analytics. And actually to deliver that work, we have to reskill people. We have to get a stronger sort of cross pollination between the tech capabilities we have and sort of the business, if you like. And there are parts of you know, elements of my team that look after them, whether that's consultant databases, client data, we have to be able to put in more of that skill set around how we manage and govern that data. And it is more and more important, more people look at it, more people use it. We all know you've got a kind of garbage in, garbage out problem. So that has to happen. And equally, we're all seeing, you know, we've all got cost pressures. Um, when I look at the skills makeup across my team, actually, if I can bring in an apprentice and I can develop them, that's a much cheaper way for me to bring in a, a skill set and it can deliver a huge amount of value. And we've had a lot of success, particularly with apprentices actually within the team. Very good, thank you. Um, more questions over at the back there. Thank you. Um, could you give some practical examples of ways in which you train empathy to your employees? Yeah. Not the technical skills, some of the no. uh, more culturally sensitive you know, skills. I'm going to say, I, I, I think this is something we're still working on, to be perfectly honest. So I wouldn't say we have that correctly right yet. But I do think we can look at other sectors. You know, I spent quite a bit of time looking at some at the hospitality sector and some of the hotel chains that have, you know, tens of thousands of employees and how they train. But there's also a really important part about understanding the individual. I mean, I always use the example, it's not quite an empathy thing, but I use the example of um, Ritz Carlton saying when they're hiring housekeepers, when they, they want the sort of person who backs out of a room and looks to see other curtains a certain way and is something just, just so. And, and I do think there's something about thinking about our recruitment. So it's about, it is a little bit about the hiring, sorry, about the training, but it's also about recruitment and being really clear what skills we need and then trying to find people. Because I think you can train most things, but some of those human characteristics, you know, I, I think are innate. No, and I, I came from retail, and I remember years and years ago, <clears throat> uh, you know, we were, we were looking at empathy, and actually there's quite clever tests that um, all the retailers sort of got into. Um, it's, it is quite hard if, if it's not um, who you are. Um, that, that said, it's not impossible. Some people probably, you know, have it um, naturally for all sorts of reasons, men and women. Um, and, um, you know, I think if you, um, if you teach people word patterns, 
um, and you um, give them access to really nice role models and you reward them for those behaviours which can be the financial or promotions, then, you know, people get what, what is important. So I, I think, it, you know, it, it, it is easier to find but not impossible mm -hmm. to help people go on the journey. Have we got any questions on the on the app, by the way? I don't want to forget that. There aren't any there if we'll carry on with the uh, with the questions. Can the I make floor. one point on the empathy? Please, James, yes. I, I mean, it's, to empathise, oh. you've got to also be balanced yourself. So I think one of the aspects of, of having a rounded workforce is getting the workforce to realise that work is work and there's family and there's health and there's other things. Getting them to appreciate that the sacrifices they make that doesn't mean they work less or harder. It means they understand their own contract with you and what they're doing. Because if they've got control over what they're doing and an understanding of what they're doing, it's easier then to reach out and, and form that bond with someone else. Right, we have a question. I, I, it was right in front of me there. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> I can't see you for looking. Uh, right, let's use some tech then. Here we go. There's a question from the audience. Do the panel feel the skills issues and skills experiences sufficiently represented in the boardroom? Well, I'd say, you know, it, it's something, up, so I can just speak briefly about the Yorkshire Building Society and the, the, uh, the board at Yorkshire Building Society are very interested in the development of the skills. And they're, in fact, they're kind of really pushing for us. We have a strategy session twice a year, and one of the big topics there will be the skills we need for the future. Um, even just the board last week, lots of questions about AI and the impact of AI. I know it's been touched on briefly here, but, and what will that do for the roles that we have in the society over the next five, ten years, and how do we equip our colleagues to address that? So I'd say it's a very, very live topic, actually, in, in our board and indeed the boards of the other organisations I've been in. Um, yeah. I'll be a bit more controversial. I think probably they need to do more. Um, so I, I think... Um, I think if you look at boards, I think they got the memo that said uh, we need more diversity. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I think that's really uh, that's really good. I, I'm proud our board's got 46% women on it. So I, th I think um, it, you know there's a lot of good work done in the last decade to to improve that. Of course, more to do. Um, but but I think um, s the skills agenda becoming a strategic agenda for most of the people that are sitting on boards when they were executives this was not a strategic agenda so so the instinct is is not for it to be a strategic agenda um, now people on boards are really clever and 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 they want their businesses to succeed um, and so I, I feel confident with people like the FSSC, um, uh, you know, doing the type of work that they're doing, if we can get government and the regulators to really get behind them, then then I think we can increase the volume of uh, focus and conversations that are that are happening. So so I think you know I think our board's pretty good on it. I go, I talk to them. They you know they they want more, faster. Uh, you know, so I feel like you know, but. But I think even they have have more to do to you know to to really um, you know help uh, help help with this agenda, and I think that will be the case for all of us in this uh, you know in this room. Amelia, at M G. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd completely agree with what you've both said around this is a really live topic, and I think historically we've been quite good on the hard skills. You know, we put people through their CFA and all those kinds of things, and I think some of these particularly some of the softer skills and how you create really good managers is a really hot topic for us. Um, because actually, that is critical to having all of this thought process around skills framework as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't spend probably as much time as you discussing um, with them, but I mean, maybe that's actually symptomatic of the fact from a strategy perspective, I spend a lot of time talking about the what's and how do we prioritize what we're trying to do and make sure everyone understands what we're trying to do we need to then progress that conversation into and are we really equipped to do that and what are those key skills where is that sort of execution focus to some of the points you were making at the start Sharon about really embedding that within the strategic priorities of the business yeah, and actually that's probably a build for for the commission which is um, probably the strategy directors in organizations we need to hook into them more because the instinct of a strategy director should be because you do the building blocks what what are the big pieces of capability that we think the organization needs for today and tomorrow and then the next thought should 
be how, how do I partner to build the skills to deliver that? And I don't, I'm, I'm not sure, again, we've quite got the instinct there. And I think, so there's a, I think there's a real opportunity, I think, for the Commission to sort of think, think about that even so more. Th yeah. There's a lot of change. Boards are permanently catching up at the moment. I, I think that's just where we are in the world with all the sustainability, the technology, mm. the, um, the political issues, etc., the geo. Uh, macro issues. So I, I think it's a very challenging time to be a director, but it's also a trick question because you can never be fully skilled because there's always emerging skills. So I think you, yeah. you've got to be aware, open, and that, that's the starting point. Very good. I see Claire taking careful notes uh, <laughs> as, uh, as you were just talking there, particularly Sharon. Well, time is our enemy. We are up. Uh, time is up. Thank you to Susan. Thank you to Sharon. Thank you to Amelia. And thank you to James. Um, thanks for your participation thank you. as well. Thank you.